Hey everybody, we are back, and now we're going to look at duties of the funeral director. So generally, we perform our duties under legal and contractual responsibilities. So legally, we have whatever our statutory responsibilities are, according to the state. We have our usual um, duties under the common law, uh, whether that be common law towards common law contracts, and then we also have the duties assigned to us by the actual written instrument, the funeral contract. And don't forget, we can actually get duties by saying things. Remember uh, the gentleman that said he would refrain from having um, people or he would make sure that people who weren't supposed to be at the funeral didn't show up. Then they did show up and smoked um, pot and whatnot. So be aware, what you say can create an issue. So if you do violate them in any way, shape, or form, you will become liable to the party that you have breached with. So it could be the state, it could be the family. Permits, statutory duties, permits. The number one thing everywhere is permitting. Nearly every state, we have to obtain permission from appropriate authorities to arrange for proper disposition. So that usually involves the processing of a death certificate through a Department of Health or Bureau of Vital Statistics or something. We usually have to get some sort of transit permit or disposition permit. And then also we have to get the appropriate cremation authorizations, whether it be permission to cremate from a medical examiner or a coroner, or Department of Health, uh, or the cremation authorization from the legally authorized person. These regulations have been held, upheld by courts as necessary and reasonable because it protects the health of the public. Um, be aware of state and local regulations pertaining to preparation and disposition of bodies. They vary widely from state to state and county to county. Some states require embalming for interstate transport, death by contagious disease. Uh, some states never require embalming under any circumstance. Uh, one of the most common areas you have an issue is if to transport a dead body, or transport human remains for any purpose, funeralization, just for transport through a state. Uh, it may require a licensed funeral, so, you know, it requires a licensed funeral director to transport. If that means a license of that state, you have an issue. So, for instance, uh, Florida, you do not have to have a license to court a dead body. So, we have removal services, we can uh, basically even give to someone else uh, over the road, um, trucking company, railroad, whoever it is, and they can transport it from here to point B. Cross state lines, we don't care as long as they have the permit and the way they go. However, once we get to Georgia, under Georgia law, Georgia requires that any transport of dead bodies be supervised, I believe, by a licensed funeral director. And that means a Georgia licensed funeral director. So a funeral director that works at the Top of Florida, right before it gets to Georgia, if they cut through the state and use any of the highways, if they're ever pulled over and they do not have the proper credentials, they can be stopped from doing what they're doing. So you can imagine that this causes problems. So understand the regulations of your state, your county, and any places you might be having to do business with because it's nearby. Well, we reviewed the general law of contracts. And by now, you should know that when you enter into an oral or written contract, you agree to undertake certain obligations, and if you breach them, you're responsible for the damages. Virtually anything that we do these apparently attaches mental health and anguish damages. Um, so we have to be very, very careful and really keep both eyes open for putting ourselves in a liable situation. Your book defines the standard for embalming. Reasonably prudent and careful persons skilled in the art of embalming. Um, Notice that it doesn't say a licensed embalmer, but a reasonably prudent and careful person skilled in the art of embalming. Um, different states might try to do different things, okay? If you don't meet the standard, even if you did everything right, you will be held liable for damages. So when we say embalming is an art and a science, if it can be determined that what you did, even if you are skilled and you did everything reasonable, if you don't meet what any reasonable embalmer would do, you may have a problem. The book mentions a $35,000 reward for viewing of a body that was negligent, negligently embalmed. And this could even affect you if they don't see it, according to the Carey versus Lima, Salmon, and Tully mortuary case. This was tried as negligence, though, and not intentional infliction of emotional distress. So any injury would suffice, including just being ill. Remember, 
Intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, we looked a little bit at that when we reviewed torts. We're going to cover this again shortly. Um, that requires one set of actions. Whereas negligence, do you remember the cardinal rules of negligence? Tort of negligence. Did you have a duty to the person? Did you breach that, breach that duty? Did the injury occur? Um, that, was it foreseeable? Did the injury actually hurt the person? All those things. So you can see there's two separate criteria, and a good lawyer is going to choose the right one to go after. And when it comes to bad funeral directing, it's just as easy to get yourself into trouble. Look at the examples in the book. Golston versus Lincoln. Funeral director failed to supervise the burial at the cemetery and was held liable when they buried the body too shallow and without a vault. Well, what they didn't tell you, okay, I went and I looked up all these cases. What they didn't tell you, this is 1971. Individual dies, leaves two children, and they make arrangements, okay? The arrangements covered a funeral service and the usual stuff. And look at that price, $1,019.77 for basically the whole kit and caboodle. That ain't too bad, huh? Five days later, we see that the vault is delivered, okay? Funeral director paid for the vault, um, does not look into the graves to check presence of burial vault, but depends upon an oral representation and cemetery to kind of just do their job. Uh, and the graves are done by cemetery employees. So regional funeral director, would they look into the grave to see if the vault is there? That would be a question, right? And 1110 is the same day for the service, okay? They were conducted at the funeral home chapel and the selected grave site. Grave was covered by a carpet of artificial turf and a lowering device. Upon completion, family members were returned by cars to the funeral chapel. Now we fast forward to the new year, a couple months later, right? Well, on February 20th, they went to see the grave site to pay their respects and check to see if their expensive stone was put. They saw an open hole in the grave site, could see her sister's body, particularly the left side of her face, could see a hand from about the waist up. Uh, subsequent investigation determined the grave was at its deepest depth, 31 inches. That's a problem. That's less than three feet. Heavy machinery driven over the grave struck the top of the casket, thus breaking it, closing the body, evidence of erosion, and there was no vault. Jones conceded Mrs. Parker had not been buried in the box or vault ordered for her, and its location was discovered relied on oral representations, and oh yeah, we'll get that done for you. Hmm. Pretty crazy, isn't it? That sounds a lot different than was held liable when buried the body too shallow and without the vault. That sounds remarkably a bit more complicated than that. Wilson versus Ferguson. Procession arrived at the graveside. Graveside wasn't ready. Funeral home was damaged because they had another funeral to get to. And what Wilson doesn't tell you is this isn't a teeny tiny thing. This is like 40. Okay, 40 cars. So you could reasonably imagine if every car seated like two people, not including the professional vehicles, family limos, or whatever, you're looking probably around 80 to 100 people, and you were too busy. You had somewhere to get to. Classy service. Classy service. My, uh, my favorite saying, how's this for stupid? Yeehaw. They arrived at the cemetery. They discovered the grave had not been completely prepared. Dirt from the grave was piled next to the grave site. No covering. Awning was half up. Um, started to rain, didn't have enough chairs. Bottom of the grave was unlevel. Such an angle, the head of the coffin would have been less than one foot below the surface of the ground, so you know that's one angle. The grave liner was damaged because they dropped the lid, okay? Um, you can tell that's a problem. The lid of the grave liner was protruding out of the ground with a piece of chain tied around it, hooked onto the back of a pickup truck, which is obviously the, um, the vault vehicle. These conditions were witnessed by the Fergusons after the arrival at the grave site. Only one grave service employee was at the grave site. Apparently, there were no means available which to correct the grave site problems, and the lid to the grave liner was lodged inverted in the ground and could not be removed. Complete mess. The representatives of the funeral home, uh, that being the drivers of the hearse and family limo, took no action to help the family, but instead left because they had other places to get to. Thus, the funeral home representative abandoned the deceased remains at the cemetery, knowing the grave was not prepared with the assistance of some good Samaritans. Remember good Samaritan laws? Family had the grave service employee remove the concrete lid to open the grave for receiving the coffin. After the coffin was loaded in the grave by hand, the grave service employee dropped his end of the lid, smashing the coffin and damaging the liner again. 
when the family members returned the next day to correct the problems at the grave site, they found someone had filled the grave, leaving the coffin so close to the surface it was visible above ground. Um, kept calling the funeral home, you can see, to fix the issue, replace the coffin. And basically, uh, in you know, the pro most polite vernacular provided, they were told to, uh, I don't know, how do they say it in the uh, New England area? Oh, yeah, go screw yourself. Okay. Brilliant, isn't it? Lamb versus Shingleton. Funeral director failed to lock a vault correctly. Mud and water got in. Family sued. This was, oopsie, made a poopsie. Okay, that was just good old-fashioned, basic negligence. These days, for the most part, we really don't get involved with making sure the lid is sealed, okay, on the, uh, on the vault. That really falls to the responsibility of the person who is placing it. Um, make sure you tell your families that. that. You can sit there and supervise and watch them drop it, but realistically, you're not going to try to get in there with a level and make sure everything's done. Clark versus Smith. Funeral director was told to hold the body until family could determine a firm. Body putrefied as a result. Funeral director was held liable because he was instructed to hold the body for the purpose of funeralization. So the expectation was no change. Failed to embalm it. Failed to put it under refrigeration. Because he did not tell the family these steps should have been necessary, he was also found negligent of that. So the act of telling them that you might want to do things to prevent decomposition or whatever, um, was separate from actually the tort of mutilation. We see mutilation here, don't we? The body changed in condition. So this is, you know, we talk more about mutilation. It's not just about making the incision for embalming. It's any change that occurs. In answer to the special, issue, special issues submitted to them, the jury found that Willie Morris, on behalf of himself and the other plaintiffs, and Bishop Henry orally agreed the defendant should take the body and keep it in a condition suitable for decent burial. Those are the words that created the contract. So, Professor Finn, what gives, man? How did this person not get it under refrigeration? Well, fact of the matter is, our laws have changed substantially. Many states have a clause in the statute now. It is a regulated procedure that remains, if they are not embalmed, must be placed under refrigeration within a certain amount of hours. Many states have something like that. But back in the day, not so much. If we looked into the 1960s, um, your, the embalming book, Embalming History and Theory by Robert Mayer, states in one of the chapters that realistically up to the 1960s, 99% of all bodies were embalmed. Look at it, boom, 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 boom. In this case, it didn't happen. Plaintiffs employed McGowan Funeral Home to conduct the service. Her body underwent a drastic change. During the afternoon, her body underwent a drastic change, becoming greatly swollen, facial features became distorted, lips curled back, dogs and cats in the street, Absolute chaos. My favorite quote from Ghostbusters. Look, photographs taken re, um, of the body in this condition and also of Mrs. Smith and her life are in record revealing, obviously, there was this gigantic change. So I propose a question to you. I propose a question to you. And any of you who have taken any of your primary embalming classes, here in Miami, we have two, embalming one, embalming two. Uh, in New York, I believe you have three, embalming one, two, and three. What would cause a body in the course of a single afternoon to go from perfectly viewable and normal to grotesque, the way it's being described here? Think about that for a second. Evidence is undisputed. The employees removed the body from the hospital shortly after midnight, placed it in the morgue at the funeral home where it remained until late afternoon of that day. It was then picked up by McGowan. Sharp conflict as to the condition of and appearance of body at that time. Clark produced testimony that no substantial change had taken place when it was removed from his place of business, but only after McGowan picked it up. And McGowan's employee, not a licensed embalmer, undertook to try to embalm the body and puffed it up, which caused its swollen, gruesome condition. Plaintiff's witnesses, however, testified that decomp was already in an advanced stage when the body arrived at the funeral home. It was in such bad condition that McGowan would not permit it to be brought inside the building until the family was called to view. And after that, members of the body had seen it. They put it in the prep room where it was photographed between 6.30 and 7. And about that time, a licensed embalmer was called and tried to preserve the body and stop the odor. Because of its condition, appearance, and odor, it was placed in a disaster bag, what we know now as a disaster pouch. You know, the big, big black gray ones with the nylon handles, not the little body bags. And no open casket. 
So what could cause something like this? We're looking at midnight to about 4 p.m., right? We're looking at midnight to 4 p.m. And we could understand no matter where you're at, decomposition in that rapid of environment, if you've taken any classes, you will know that you need a lot of heat, you need a lot of water. has to be some serious problems there. Or you have clostridium perfringens, true tissue gas, which easily could distend the body in several hours to the condition it's being said. So fact of the matter is, we're looking at a case that it was poor embalming, which certainly could speed things up. More water, not enough fluid actually caused the issue. We could also look at true tissue gas as being a causative agent. Mayor versus Notker. Funeral director agreed to hold a funeral procession for family. And when he didn't hold it from leaving, family sued his buttocks for mental anguish for a heart attack that may or may not have resulted. So, again, that's the tip of the iceberg. Meyer alleged he suffered some severe emotional distress, mental anguish, and disturbance of mental and emotional tranquility, along with <laughs> cardiac arrest, because of the funeral director's conduct. So the decedent was killed in an automobile accident. Already a bad situation. Okay? Also killed was stepmother. So now we're already looking at one of those fun things. Remember this back in our business law review? Simultaneous death. Okay? Under wills. So you know this is already going to be a party. You have probably kids from separate marriages, et cetera, et cetera. That evening, the daughter of the stepmother, the wife, contacted the funeral home and instructed to bring both bodies. Okay, done. No big deal there. Everyone's happy. Yay. Son of Mr. Decedent finds out Thursday evening. They drive to the mortuary. They meet the funeral director. Mayor took not to aside for the purpose of explaining that he wished the arrangements for his father's room to be separate from those of the second wife. Okay, so now we're looking at a control issue, aren't we? Adult son. If you look at that hierarchy, we see that he could be in control of his dad, not the stepmom. Daughters are in control of the stepmom. This makes perfect line down the middle, black and white sense here. At some point during the conversation, funeral director represented that the mayor had no choice in the burial arrangements because his father's wife had survived his father in the accident. In fact, Notker did not know which of the scenes had died first and had assumed they were killed simultaneously. So now we have to ask the question, does that matter? Ask yourself the question. Does whoever lived separate matter to who has power to control disposition under the common law hierarchy? And your answer had better be monosyllabic and start with the letter N. No. That has no bearing whatsoever. It might have a bearing on distribution of the estate and a bunch of other garbage, but not on power to control disposition and who has the right of disposition. The parties agreed to a double funeral with separate burials. The bodies, don't you like that, of Meyer's father was to be interred in Iowa Falls. Meyer was informed that Mrs. Jones had already selected the casket for her mother and that all he had to do with respect to a casket was to concur in the choice. Knocker told Meyer that in any event, he would have to select a sealer casket because the embalming fluid used in his father's body was a very strong formaldehyde solution which produced a harsh and unpleasant odor. If you're already detecting BS, your BS meter is starting to bottom out, you know, the needle's digging in, probably right. Meyer did choose a sealer cask identical to the one chosen by the daughter of the stepmom. He said there's nothing wrong with the cask. It was very handsome. He agreed to the model because it was the harmonious thing to do. I'm going to do this because, damn it, I just don't need to fight about it. It's as simple as that. So then... More and more stuff, more details, okay? Notger assures Meyer, funeral director, that he personally would go to Iowa Falls to assist with the burial. Okay? Pretty crazy. Look at all these things that are going on. That same time, he explains to, the son explains to the funeral director, it's important he'd be able to see his father's body, if only to confirm his father was actually dead. Any of you who have taken a psychology of death and dying, or a funeral service psychology or thanatology course, know the benefit. Chapter 1 in the Embalming History and Theory book. Viewing the deceased is an important part of recognizing and acknowledging the finality of the death. So what does the funeral director say? Hell no! But he says it sweetly. 
right? He shouldn't view the body because of the offensive odor, because the body will not look like his father. Oh, my God. Then demands to see the body. She expressed a belief that the funeral director could not legally prevent her from doing this, although he acknowledged that might be true. The funeral director was firm in his refusal to allow, to allow the decedent's daughter-in-law to view the body, telling her that in six months she might be able to stand to hear how bad the body really was. Myers left the funeral home Friday without seeing the body. He has painted this horrible picture that in six months, you know, I really don't want you to hear you coming back telling me how bad it was. The next day, they went to the scene of the automobile accident. While they're talking about the end of the stick for the funeral director, they bump into the cop. The very same cop who reported the accident. Patrolman tells the son, by the way, dad died of respiratory failure, probably stress and shock. There are no marks in his face. Clearly, this is an unviewable case. After discovering this, they call the lawyer. They return to the funeral home. The funeral director still puts up a fight to open the casket. And obviously, promptly shuts his pie hole when the attorney calls in. Okay? They finally see the body and reported it was okay. As Meyer prepared to see the body himself, Notger warned him that whatever he did, he should not touch his father's nose as it had been reconstructed. It's like, dude, at this point, dude, don't you just want to slap this idiot? Right? After seeing the body, the Meyer felt the sealer casket would have been unnecessary. The body was in good condition, condition to permit the opening of the casket, and there was no abnormal order. Now he's caught the funeral director in a lie. A lie. So forget the fact that we might have a tying arrangement. You've got to have a ceiling casket or I'm not going to do blah, blah, blah. Okay, That's debatable. But you have a fraud in the inducement, do you not? You have, a, you have fraudulent behavior going on here. You need to buy this because what blah, 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 blah. Bodies needs a sealer. Immediately after the services, okay, one of the pallbearers informed the Myers that he and the other pallbearers had been dismissed by Notger and told they would not be needed at the burial site. The dismissal was contrary to the family wishes, apparently rectified after they slapped some clue into the funeral director. So now we finally get to the issue at hand. All this stupidity isn't even the crux of the case. Remember, failure to hold a procession. You said you were going to wait, and you did. This is just all the fun prior. So they're taken to their car, and they realize that one of the son's grandchildren left his raincoat at the decedent's house. They're also concerned about the number of persons planning to prepare uh, for, or planning to come to the luncheon, so they decided to make a quick trip to the house to take care of those matters. And to this end, the stepdaughter of the decedent told the funeral director not to do anything further until they returned. Not to replied that was fine, and there was no hurry to get to the cemetery, apparently. When they return to the church, 12 to 15 minutes later, bye-bye. <laughs> While they'd been away, the funeral director's part-time assistant, or full-time concierge, right, had started with the hearse towards the gravesite in Iowa Falls. And Mr. Junkunz stated in his, in his deposition, he did not know he was supposed to wait for the family. Good God Almighty. Upon finding everyone gone, what do you think the family did? And if your answer is the word freaked, yeah. So they drive like a bat out of hell to overtake what they assume was the procession. They get stopped for violating the speed limit. And the officer who detained them did not care. I mean, think about that. You get pulled over speeding. I'm on my way to a funeral. Sure you are, Buster. We're all on the way to the funeral. We get there eventually, right? And then Mr. Meyer, the son of the deceased, becomes ill. Because of all the collective BS and bad karma that has now gone on, right? They finally get to the cemetery. Everyone is gathered for the burial. However, the poor son, taken to a physician and hospitalized. The burial was postponed. The deposition of the doctor who treated the son is that basically he had damn near a heart attack. The doctor states in his deposition that stress and emotional trauma can cause this type of attack. In response to the hypothetical question, he's asked to assume the truth of the facts asserted by Mayer, and he said that probably that all this garbage was the deciding factor in causing the heart attack. 
there are all sorts of factual disputes. As you can imagine, trial court acknowledged the presence of factual issues, but considered them immaterial. The court didn't even give it to a jury. Summary judgment. Because if the plaintiff at trial were to establish the proof in all the facts and reasonable inference therefrom contained in his deposition other materials presented, there would still be not a submissible area, uh, issue. Realistically, you have a contract, you said you're going to do it, and you didn't. The jury cannot see it in any other way. So the interesting precedent that came out of it, we hold that recovery of damages may be had in appropriate cases for mental distress absent physical trauma. Remember negligence. You needed an injury. You needed the physical impact, the physical impact rule. Arising out of contract to perform funeral services. Oh, snap! We're not even going to look at a tort violation. We're going to say that if you breach a contract and you get mental distress, even without physical damage, you can get damages. Boing, 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 problem. Right? Doesn't that just completely shift the game? Previous court found summary judgment without need for jury to analyze the facts for the family on appeal. Funeral director launches his appeal, wins it, because obviously there's some issues there. The case was reversed, remanded low court for a jury uh, trial on specific issues. It's very clear that only the trier of fact was going to make some stuff here. But initially the family won. And then the funeral director appeals it saying, no, 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 no. We need to iron these things out. That's the crux of the issue. And the appellate court agreed. So the damages, you know damages is going overboard these days, right? Jury awarded a spouse $100,000 when a dippy doodle neglected to bury a cowboy hat with the deceased and returned it to the wrong relative. So not only did you get your merit badge, you also got a gold star with it. Brilliant. You were supposed to bury it, and then when you screwed that up, they told you to give it to someone, and you screwed that up as well. Now, that's just good old-fashioned American ingenuity and overachievement. Safeguarding the body. Funeral home left the chapel door unlocked by accident. Body was sexually assaulted. Funeral home was found liable for negligence. It failed to take a reasonable precaution, i.e., lock the stupid door. We have a duty to make sure that our facilities are secure because of the nature of the contents therein, especially the morgue in our chapels, right? Privacy? And we will discuss specific privacy laws in this course, I promise you. But if you fail to comply with their request for confidentiality, you'll be held liable. Funeral director agrees to transport and bury a body without due publicity, then takes a picture of it and uses it for advertising. Court rightfully said that he wins a Darwin Award. Same thing goes when you fail to exclude people when you are told to do so, especially as we've seen. They show up in inappropriate attire, start doing drugs, and making everyone's life miserable. So remember, in law review, we talked about warranties. Warranties. Remember what the two were? Remember what they were? Warranty of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose. Sound familiar? Okay. And we are held to those same implied warranties unless we disclaim them, if your state allows them to be disclaimed. Funeral directors held liable. When the casket fell apart on the way to the grave, there was nothing more classy than that. Family said the funeral director knew that this particular product was garbage. Okay? It was crappy. Had trouble closing the casket. One corner could not close, and the face was still exposed. Now, we are looking at rocket science. That If you can't close the lid, and even when you do, you still see the body, there's something wrong with the unit. Hmm? <laughs> Paul Bearer was injured when a handle fell off. Funeral director was held liable, even though an earlier court released him from it based on who the user of the casket was. So think about that one for a second. Who is the user of a casket? And what do you think the funeral director said versus, versus what the plaintiff said? So in the earlier court, right, where the defendant wins, funeral director was held liable, even though the earlier court released him. So defendant won because he probably said the user of the casket is the dead guy. Dead guy doesn't really care because dead guy's in the middle of it. 
Handle falls off, no big deal. Doesn't affect what he's doing. On appeal, probably the appellate court said, well, that might be so. However, it could be reasonably expected if the product is to be carried that a user of the product would be one who carries it. And thus, boom. Always exercise reasonable care when training family or the body in a limo or a hearse, respectively. You are responsible for transporting them in a safe and non-negligent manner. Exercise ordinary care in transporting persons and remains. Now, this brings up an important concept, okay, that if you do more and your personal business standard is more, that then becomes ordinary care, okay? You're going to see where that plays into effect in some of the cases coming up. In order to be liable, it is necessary to show the negligent driver of the vehicle was an agent of the funeral home. If, it, if an employee of the funeral home or a third-party contractor hired by the funeral home and that contractor is represented to be a funeral home employee along with the vehicle, you are liable. So this makes sense. If you rent the limo and you do not tell the family that you are renting a limo, they're going to assume it's your car. They're going to assume that the person driving it is your employee. Rightfully. Okay, rightfully so. Remember we talked about agency and third parties and whatnot? You hired an agent, your principal, and then you delegated a task, in this case, duty to transportation and the vehicle. If you rent the limo and you use one of your employees to drive it, you are liable for the actions of the employee. The car breaks down or something, if you've disclosed that it's a rented vehicle, that might be a different story, which is why you want to make sure that your companies that you're contracting with have the appropriate liability insurance. Huh? And if you completely disclose that this is John with ABC Limo, and isn't their fleet beautiful, this is one of their Cadillacs. Have you not just disclosed that it is not your agent? Realistically, it's an independent contractor. They're on their own. Um, it is what it is. Fact patterns for questions like this almost always fall into those type of categories. All you have to ask is, one, is it an employee? If it is yes, you're liable for the, for the negligent driving. If it is not your employee, all you have to ask is, does the family think it is? Or do they know it is not? So if family rents the limo, family gets the driver, then they sue you because of a negligent driver. That's not going to work. You didn't pick it. You didn't hire it. They provided it. It's on them. Okay? If there's no agency, it's not your fault. Volunteer driver in a procession negligently gets into an accident, injures their passengers. It's not your fault, generally. Make sure you check your state statutes. Okay? What you get on your professional exams and what you get on the exams in this course are generalities. State-specific items may supersede this information, but you will not be asked those sort of things under the general education of mortuary law or on your board exam. That is not specific to states. So with aftercare, there is no specific case law um, at the time of the writing of this textbook, but the book does reference a pastor that was sued for malpractice for not getting help for a person who committed suicide when they noticed the signs. Uh, that case was Nace versus Grace Community Church. So what are some things that you can do to prevent getting sued with aftercare? Well, first of all, refer to your aftercare employees as grief facilitators and train them to do that job. They're not grief counselors. When you use the word counselor, that generally connotates some type of licensed mental health professional. So if they do not have a degree um, in social work or counseling or are not a medical doctor's trained in psychiatry, you should not use the word counselor ever for something like that. You should refer any serious issues or apparently serious problems to an appropriately licensed mental health professional. And all of your aftercare programs should be covered by malpractice and liability insurance. Okay? So we said we're going to talk about negligence. Now we're going to look at it. Funeral directors have to comply with the duties and obligations that arise by contract as well as law. When you have a violation of law, if it's not criminal, remember, tort is a civil, a civil action, um, the court is going to award damages to those who suffer. Okay? 
And there's the definition according to Gilligan and Steve um, regarding a tort of private or civil wrong other than by breach of contract for which there may be action for damages. Two duties recognized by law which impact you directly. A duty not to interfere with the right of burial. That is generally put into the context of you holding the body for ransom where you refuse to do anything until the pay pays or refuse to give up the body until the family pays your removal bill. We'll talk about that. The duty of exercising reasonable care to keep the funeral home premises or other places under control in a reasonably safe condition. Remember in business law, we had talked about duty to people who visit. Said under the old common law, there was a varying degree of standard depending on whether they're supposed to be there or not. And under the modern law, that, that is kind of shifted. This book focuses on the old rule, which is important. And obviously a violation of either of those results in a problem for you. So wrongfully withholding a body, ransoming a body, holding a body for ransom, the surviving spouse from next to kin has the right of custody. Remember that. Right of custody, right of disposition. And also to the body condition that it was left in by death and the right to not have any interference from you or anybody else. You cannot hold a body in the United States for ransom and refuse services until they pay. Now, some time ago, maybe about a year, year and a half ago, 2014, 2015, there was a situation where a person died, I believe it was the Bahamas, Bahamas or Jamaica, but one of the um, Caribbean islands. And they were trying to get the body repatriated to the United States. Family lived in New Jersey. And that funeral director would not let that body go until such time as someone paid their bill. Everyone was up in arms, jumping up and down, screaming bloody murder. I'm going to sue. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, you can invent your own reality because under the laws of that country, a funeral director is perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine. Hold a body for ransom until you complete the bill. Now, in the United States, there is no jurisdiction in any of the 50 states that permits holding a body for ransom. You cannot interfere with the right of disposition. If you get stiffed on a bill, that's between you, the family, and the collection agency. Okay? Outside of the United States, you might run into issues with that, and it's perfectly legal there. You screwing it up, wrongfully interring, misidentifying. We're going to end you just as well, no matter which one you choose in court, for interfering with the right to disposition. Now, mutilation. Mutilation. The body is mutilated. The tort is committed because the state of the body was changed from the condition it was received. When we make an incision to embalm, we mutilate the body, which is why we receive permission to embalm, because it is implied that we will do certain things to it that are, by law, construed as literal mutilation. There's a book. Uh, the book has a case where a coroner authorized embalming of a body that was unidentified. Funeral director was brought to court because the funeral director claimed it was beneficial. Does not say if the suit was successful or not. This is 1940. So what do you see as the issue there? How could the funeral director have completely avoided liability? If you came up with the concept, well, hell man, coroner said to do it. The answer is correct. If you're given an instruction by a superior state officer that is within their duty and power to compel you to do, you are indemnified. You must comply. If the coroner shows up and takes a body from your funeral home and they have the, um, they have the paperwork for it, that they are going to have an autopsy performed because of a suspicious cause of death, the family cannot go against that. That coroner's inquest stands, does it not? But the funeral director, trying to be polite, trying to be nice, trying to do whatever silly thing they do, said it was beneficial. That's the issue. Funeral home embalmed without permission and in violation of the decedent's Jewish faith. Even though they saved the blood, okay, if you are familiar with the Jewish faith and what we're supposed to do when we embalm, the judge allowed the suit to let a jury decide as to whether the funeral director was aware of the adverse consequences of the decision to immediately embalm the body. What do you probably think the jury came back with? Unauthorized autopsies will also get you into trouble. Now, if a coroner, medical examiner, judge, or legally authorized individual did not authorize it, do not let it happen. 
someone shows up and shows you paperwork, you can call the family. Generally, this almost always falls into a fact pattern where someone in the family is requesting a private autopsy because coroners, medical examiners, and the court in general can basically do whatever they want within the statutory confines of their abilities. If you assist, if you assist with the autopsy, if you assist with the quote unquote unlicensed activity, non permitted activity, unapproved activity, or allow that to happen, you will be held jointly liable. And there it is. Courts do hold that they are acting under orders of a legal authority that funeral directors cannot be held liable if it happens on their property or even if they assist, which is quite common. The embalmer will assist the pathologist in some areas, and then when the pathologist is done, the embalmer starts immediately on their aspect of the job. So a duty of care, owing a duty of care. Under the modern law, we kind of had one standard for pretty much everyone, right? That's what the business law review said. But realistically, under the old rule, the common law, which still exists in some areas, funeral home owes a duty of care to each invitee to maintain the premises in a reasonably safe condition for its intended use. And the level of care is dependent on whether they are an invitee or a trespasser. So a person that has a legal reason to be there, not really a license, okay, but a person who comes to a funeral, a person who comes to inquire about services, a person who comes to talk about pre-need, a person with a quote-unquote valid reason to be there, you owe a very high level of care to them because they're essentially invited by the landowner or business owner, and they are your clients, customers, or visitors. With a trespass, you have a low level of care. They're generally not invited and not authorized, but look what it says. You still owe a standard of care to them, whether they should be there or not. You need to have a reasonably safe situation. Be aware that even invitees, because of the emotional state they're in, may be subject to something more than reasonable or ordinary. The book refers to a step matching the bricks of a porch. Someone injured themselves upon leaving. The funeral director said, hey, man, dude, okay, whatever. If they came in okay, they should not be falling over themselves at the end of the service and then suing me for it. And the judge said, well, it should be expected that at the conclusion of funeral services, a person will be emotionally upset and not be really looking out for things. That goes back to 1957. You're also responsible for snow, ice, and wet pavement, people coming and going in and out of your funeral home, which is why you need to keep your walkways clean. You keep salt in the back to make sure that nothing freezes up. Here in Florida, we usually have to have textured type of pavements, wet floor signs, rubber mats, all sorts of ridiculousness, so people don't break their necks. Now, it doesn't have a specific slide, but with trespassers, the case that I remember is that an individual broke into a funeral home was going to steal some stuff. And the funeral had a known defect in the floor where there was a hole in the chapel. And during services, they had a person stand next to the hole so that no one would fall in because the owner was just too flat out cheap to fix it. Isn't that embarrassing? Right? And the person broke his leg, broke his ankle, whatever it was, and then sued the funeral home and won because of this theory that he is owed a level of care. And under the law, this was a known defect in the facility. Anyone could have hurt themselves, including an invitee. And because it had been there for years and the owner failed to take action, the owner was liable and deemed liable for it. Generally, you are liable. The pallbearers are clergy. They're considered volunteers. Okay? Volunteers. If it is caused by a tort of the funeral director, your negligence is basically what that is saying. And where do you think you're going to get negligence with pallbearers and clergy? Think about that for a second. Where is it that you are going to injure a pallbearer? And if you said carrying the casket, you're off to a good start, right? Because do we not give, in many jurisdictions, instructions on how to carry? Do you give the instructions only in one location? Maybe you should give the instructions any time you come to a stop and someone has to carry a casket. So with the clergy, minister slipped on fake grass, placed on a marble slab to close the grave. Even the vault company, even though the vault company placed the mats, the funeral director was found jointly liable. Courts said the funeral director had full responsibility to control the funeral, including prior discovery of reasonably discoverable conditions of the premises, 
that would be unreasonably dangerous in correction thereof, or a warning to an invitee. High level of care, 1964. Trust me when I say that one has stuck around for a while. Which is why we should go walk the path to the grave. If it is natural turf, make an announcement, get everyone's attention, and say, folks, watch your step. Natural, natural turf. There are hidden pockets and gaps you may not be able to see. Please be very careful. If you need assistance, please let us know. We can provide an associate to help you over to the grave, etc. Funeral director was held liable for injuries incurred by plaintiff Paul Bearer when he fell while car carrying a handleless casket in the church. Funeral director did not tell him where to place his hands. It was affirmed that those type of caskets just in general suck to carry and that the funeral director had in past given instructions for both handled and unhandled caskets. He created a standard of care for himself. Do you see that? If reasonable funeral directors in that area did not do this, none issue. But if you have done it repeatedly and always do it, it falls on you. Courts are very reluctant to award damages. Very reluctant to award damages. It cannot be measured with some precision. That's why we have the physical impact rule. How much are you hurt and we'll fix it, right? Uh, this is obviously changed in the United States. It only required to show some physical injury to be awarded damages in those jurisdictions to retain the injury concept. Okay? It is very evident in breach of tort that affects the funeral industry. Courts have gone out of their way to make plenty of exceptions just for us. They cite that people wronged by funeral directors often have little or no other way to get anything other than through mental anguish. So intentional infliction of emotional distress. This tort permits recovery when the funeral director's conduct is intentional, wrongful, outrageous, reckless, and malicious, and done with the intention of causing the plaintiff severe emotional distress. Ask yourself two questions. Did they intend to do it, and they didn't, did they intend to do it to the point that they knew they were sticking it to the family? Then you have intentional infliction of emotional distress. In Florida, judge held that absent physical impact, mental anguish for negligent directing could not be recovered unless plaintiffs alleged that funeral director's conduct exceeded all bounds reasonably tolerated by society, such as to suggest malice or the entire want of care or great indifference. 1979. In Florida, the funeral director was alleged to have put the wrong body in the casket with the right clothes and when confronted with the fact, argued with the family it was the right body. After changing the body, the funeral director just threw the clothes over the deceased. The court obviously ruled in this complaint, that the type of malice was implied. Okay? The employee spent a half an hour trying to convince the person that the dead guy was the right one. Upon admitting they screwed up, they removed the bare clothing from the wrong corpse, and instead of dressing it, just threw it on the other, leaving ugly bruises on their arms exposed. Probably senile purpura, right? Bruising because of age. They sued the living hell out of them. On motion to dismiss, the appellant's counsel conceded there was nothing further to allege. The trial court dismissed the amended complaint with prejudice. Don't even try to sue. The suit was actually dismissed. And it was only on appeal that it went back to the trial court. Can you believe that? The judge basically said, oh, nope, no physical impact. Have a nice life. On appeal, court of equity, we need to cut this behavior. So instead of looking for the physical breach, some courts have looked to a contractual breach in order to hit you for mental anguish. Nature of the funeral contract and the contract itself puts the funeral director on notice that a breach would probably result in mental anguish and how the damages could be awarded in a breach of a funeral contract. We're not even going to look at this as a tort of negligence. We're just going to award damages on a funeral contract because this is the best way to do it without touching the tort. This was stated in Iowa because a funeral contract is not one of trade and commerce but handles matters of life and death and matters of mental concern and solitude. Solicitude, I'm sorry. The further land is home in California. Another ruling added that an award of damages for mental distress serves as a useful and necessary means to maintain professional standards within the funeral industry and that mental anguish is often the only method to compensate victims of wrongful acts by funeral directors. Well, 
Some people have overachieved. Okay? And have said that even simple negligence can nail you for infliction of mental distress. So we have negligent infliction of mental distress. Court held that a funeral director could be sued under this theory in Wisconsin. And these states are still in the minority, because this is very dangerous. Just you screwing up is going to infer malice and hate, and you wanted it to happen and give you lots and lots of penalties. Uh, Ohio, a funeral home was let go on appeal because the appeals court said the state Supreme Court had only permitted cases with intentional infliction to receive damages, and that negligent infliction, rightfully so, is not the same. It also recognized that Ohio law did not authorize an exception to this, even when a dead body was involved. The funeral home in question had two visitations at the same time and had the wrong body in the wrong room, clearly, because they got sued for it, right? Punitive damages, remember your damages, are a way to punish the defendant, not just to compensate the plaintiff. Compensation, those are compensatory damages, remember? Punitive damage are meant to punish and send essentially a mess. It will not be tolerated, and if you do it, expect that the court will punish in the form of monetary damages. They're not awarded in cases of simple negligence, which cause unintentional injury, and only given when outrageous... California had a case where a funeral director negligently shipped the cremated remains subsequently lost. Court dismissed the claim for punitive damages due to the simple negligence was unintentional. 1980. Even if it was willful, there's plenty of damage a court can assess, as is evident of your text. And most liability insurances do not cover punitive damages, and they must be paid out of your own pocket at the funeral home. So folks, thanks for paying attention. We will see you in the next lesson.